All right. Uh, you can see how many things that we do uh, around the Word of God here. And Pastor Walker has it not only in the preaching of the Word of God, but he has us read Scripture right from the Bible. We work our way through the Bible. We have all kinds of discipleship uh, programs and, and Sunday school classes. Uh, the Bible is a very important book. Matter of fact, there's no better book than this book right here. And I think many times, uh, though we know better and we've heard these things, matter of fact, I'll be uh, in uh, chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. Uh, we'll be going over verse 16, but I'll be going through verse 14 through 17. And we're familiar with these things, but sometimes I think we forget about how important the Word of God is, how important the Bible is for us as Christians. We need the Word of God. And uh, there's no better book than the Bible. I was going to uh, begin a series on the book of Romans, and then with the uh, discipleship class, I may not be back in here for a while. And so um, that's why I just picked this passage of Scripture out that we're going to spend a little time on. Uh, nothing new, but a good reminder of how important it is. And I think for all of us who might be familiar, we've read the Bible dozens of times, hundreds of times, studied it. Maybe you haven't, but many have. Uh, and there's always something there that we can get out of it. Um, I've, I've enjoyed the study. I've jotted down a lot of little notes. You might have to bear with me at moments because I got things written sideways and in the columns and all kinds of stuff. And so I might take a moment to look a few things up. But we need to keep in mind that there is no better book. Too many people, I know my pastor, my first pastor up in Cheyenne, um, he had a very small library uh, compared to many other pastors that their libraries go around all their walls. And I, and I asked him about that. And he said, you know, you need to just spend your time here. Those other books are good. They can be helpful. But that's all they are. They're just tools to be helpful. And we need to spend time here. The answers are here. And we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning or this evening. Whatever time of day it is uh, where we're at. It's dark out, so I guess that's evening. So if you'd open to 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to read beginning in verse 14. <clears throat> but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Well, what's he talking about? Well, learning what? Learning the Word of God. For us, the Bible, the complete uh, canon of Scripture that we have available to us. We need to continue to learn. There's no better book than the Bible to learn from for any area of our lives. Continues on in verse 15, he says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Now, you can go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 1, I'm sorry, and verse 5. And he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So we see here, he had learned of the word of God and how to be saved. And we see that here in our text. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures because of his mother and his grandmother. It's sad and uh, my mother's no longer with me. So I guess I can say this and not feel bad with her sitting there. But I didn't know anything. Other, I never saw a Bible in our house around laying out. I never saw my parents pray. And we see that Timothy, he was taught from the scriptures. He understood about salvation. And that's where it all begins for all of us. And it's important that we learn from those things. And there's no better book than this book to learn about salvation and how to live our lives. And so in that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee, what does it say? 
wise. We talk about wisdom all the time, but there is no other book, no better book to teach wisdom than this. Just recently, I've uh, finished going through, well, I'm, I'm starting, in, I don't know, this is my 30th time or so through the Bible, and you know, I've been going through Psalms and finished Proverbs. I'm now in Ecclesiastes. I'm really enjoying Ecclesiastes. And, uh, and we can draw a lot of little things. There are a lot of wisdom to apply in our lives and a lot of wisdom of what not to do. And, uh, and so it's about wisdom, and God has given that to us, and there's no better book for that. And so, which are able to make the wise first unto salvation, and he goes on, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Making it very clear, though it's in the scriptures, but it's stated that that salvation can only come through faith in Christ Jesus. No other thing, no other person, no religion. I don't want to say other religion because we don't practice religion here. We practice a faith in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 16, you're all familiar with, or very familiar with, all Scripture. Not some Scripture, not just Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed. And it's profitable. So it's good for us, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man, and I think we could put in here woman without changing uh, the meaning, that the man and woman of God may be perfect, complete or mature, thoroughly furnished unto some good works. No, all good works. Everything we do is to be a good work. How we live our lives, how we read our Bibles, how we worship God, how we deal with one another in our jobs, in every area and aspect of our lives, in all good works, not just some, not those that are easy, but all. The Bible is still the number one selling book in the world. And I've heard this just recently. There's been two and a half to five billion sold between 1850 and now. And I'm sure that number is even higher. And if you were to count things like John and Romans, uh, they, they send, they've sent out uh, little churches like uh, Foothills Baptist Church in Loveland. Uh, they've done over a million themselves. Last year they hit a million. They're going to try and hit two million this year. We've done uh, about 175,000 here at First Baptist Church of Westminster. And so the Word of God is getting out billions of copies. Why? It's because people often reject it, but many people still want the Bible. They know in their heart of hearts that this is a good book. They may not agree with it, they may not like it, and they're going to do their best to change it and modify it. But they also know that it's important and it's valuable. It's profitable, as it says here in our text. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes, or the remainder of this time, I've got about 29 minutes. And we're going to have some reasons on why there's no better book. It's not just because I say it. It's because it is. It has always, has always been. And it always will be. That's the great thing about it. Because it's the Word of God. And it doesn't change. Because God doesn't change. And it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, just like our God. You can count on it. Just because culture changes, man has not changed since the fall. And we need salvation. And he touches on that in our text. We see that to make you wise unto salvation. We need to remember in verse 15 that wisdom comes with fear and reverence of God. We see that in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord. To have reverence for Him. The Bible teaches that to us. We should know that, but it's sad when I hear professing Christians irreverent to God. They have no fear of God. 
The world doesn't know any better, and they don't fear God because they don't believe in him. But sometimes we Christians don't fear God. We don't revere him. He is worthy of worship. He is the one that we go to and ask prayers for and from. He needs to be revered. We need to fear God. Fearing God opens our mind and our hearts to salvation. It was that way when I first got saved. I I wasn't looking for God, but I was looking. And a good Christian woman who was living her faith, not talking about her faith, it opened my mind. And as I received her Bible, which I mocked her about giving it to me, that I would have said, I'll fall asleep by the second verse, so I might be giving it back to you. That didn't happen. Once I opened it and started to read, I couldn't put it down until I was done. And through that, I got saved. I found out I had a God that I need to fear. And in my fallen condition, I deserved condemnation. Well, I was already condemned. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But that I was on my way to hell. And I thought, I was a pretty good Joe. I wasn't as bad as all them other folks. I had plenty of problems. And so it made me wise unto salvation. This book makes us wise unto salvation. I never, I didn't get saved going to church, listening to some preacher preach. I got saved directly through the Word of God. And that's why it's important that our preachers and our Sunday school teachers preach from the Word of God, this book, because there's no better unto salvation. It tells us that we need to be saved. For the wages of sin is death. We need to be saved because we are are separated from God eternally without Christ Jesus. It's the wisest thing you've ever done. If you know Jesus Christ today, there is nothing more wise than understanding our fallen nature and that we need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. It then also tells us why we need salvation. Because God loves us. And in spite of our enmity toward God until the time we get saved, and that's spoken of in Romans 8, verse 7, and I'm not going to take the time to read all of these in James chapter 4, verse 4, that we are enemies of God by nature. We have no place for God. We hate God. We don't understand the things of God. We may know some things about them. But uh, in spite of that, as it tells us in Romans, how that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We need his salvation. And why? Because we're sinners. And on our own, we can't be saved. We are already condemned. It tells us in John 3.18, and I'm going to camp there just briefly, or I'll never get finished, so I'm going to try and... Sharon was trying to straighten me out a bit. I get a little windy at times. Uh, Now she's mad at me because I mentioned her. John 3.18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. So for the believer, we're not condemned. We have eternity in heaven with him. But he that believeth not is condemned already. There have been people we could get in, and I'm not going to go try and get into this subject now. People will call it uh, the sovereignty of God. Some will call it election. It'll get into Calvinism, uh, which really is a whole different thing. But many will say, well, if if God chose people to be saved, then he chose people to not be saved. It's not true. It tells us right here, but he that believeth not is condemned already. We are already condemned. God did never have to choose us not to be saved. Every one of us, outside of Christ, from the moment we're born, are condemned already until we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, except children and imbeciles, those who are not able to make that determination. God will save them. 
And so he has done that for us because we all need salvation. He tells us who can save us. And there's only one name, Jesus, the name above all names. Jesus tells us in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It is by him and him alone. It doesn't matter how good we are, how bad we are, who we think we are, how other people think we are. It's nothing about anyone but him. It is about him. He alone can save us. It also tells us how to be saved. And as with anything, nothing just happens without knowing how, but God tells us how to be saved. Because by ourselves, we can attempt to try to be saved, but we can't. We fall short of the truth of the of salvation. We need to receive the free gift of God. You're all familiar with Ephesians 2.8, one of my life verses. That for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift of God, freely given to mankind. All he has to do is receive it. But yet many times, they won't. And I dare say there may be some here tonight, or maybe on Sunday morning, and we preach these messages all the time, but it's, it's still here. It's never been received here. And if the rapture were to happen, they'll wonder where everybody went and they'll be left behind. We need to know how to be saved and the Bible tells us clearly that we must simply call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. It's pretty simple. Now, I'm not going to get into how the living the new life that we have in Christ Jesus, there's where it gets a little like work. But to get saved, the work's been accomplished. All we have to do is receive that gift that God has for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the wisdom of salvation also tells us who will be saved. It's not just for some people. It's not the wealthy. It's not the poor. It's not those who are healthier than others. It's not those of a certain race or anything else. Everyone needs salvation, for we are all condemned already that don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we are all sinners and we all need to be saved. The whosoever wills. For it is not the will of God that any should perish, but all come to repentance. God loves us and wants to save us. And he made us wise unto salvation through this book. And there is no better book than the King James Version for the English uh, speaking Bible. Secondly, there's no better book, as it tells us in verse 16, for doctrine. Doctrine sounds very theological, sounds very spiritual and religious, and we can throw that around. Yeah, well, I study the doctrines of the Word of God. It's teachings. It's it's not some big fancy thing. These are simply the teachings of God to man, that we need to be saved, and then once we're saved, how we live to always do good works, because that's why we were created. That's why we were saved. And that's speaking about that which was right. And back in our text, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed it is from Him and Him alone. And it is profitable. It is good for teachings. It is good for doctrine. It teaches us that which is right. It's not about a list of do's and don'ts but it is a guide for us to know what is right, what does not offend God, what pleases God, how we can live lives godly, righteously, the way it has always been intended. It's so that we can know what is right according to the God of all creation, that we 
not offend him. And I've, I know I've said that now two or three times just in a few seconds. And I think that word offend is important. We offend God regularly. You know, we throw a word that, around that word sin, and it's true. We're sinners, and we sin. But what does that? what is that sin? We've offended God. And he's easily offended because there's only one right way for everything, and it's his way. And we don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with it. That's why he's given us this book, that we can know what it, how to live our lives to not offend God to be pleasing in his sight. And that, but when we do offend him, he has made us a way to get right with him once again for salvation and then even after salvation for our day-to-day lives. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That we can get up out of the dirt and the muck and the mire and keep working for the Lord. Someone once said that a Bible that's falling apart probably belongs to someone who isn't. I used to uh, give a lot of people my Bibles. They needed a Bible, and I'd give them mine. And then I got tired of moving notes all the time to my new Bible. And so I kind of hung on to this one, and I won't give this one to people. I'll buy them a new one. And I know that I've used this a little bit because I got holes worn through the pages. And I can't even write on some spots because of the finger oils and stuff from turning pages. Ink won't stick. And I'm saying that not to impress anyone. I hope yours, you're working on your second or third Bible by wearing it out. But we need to spend time because without... If our Bible is not falling apart, we probably are. We have struggles in our lives. I I think of Felicia's friend. Where is he? And I I can only speculate, and I'm not judging him anyway. I'm just stating a fact. There's probably a good chance he's not in his Bible as maybe he once was. And he's now struggling, and that can happen to any one of us. The moment you get out of this book... You're going to fall, your life is going to fall apart. It's, it's that simple. Like it or not, it's the truth. And anybody that has been there, and we all probably can say we have. At times we just got away, we haven't, maybe for a week even, a month. And all that, things just don't feel right. Things are, we're just struggling. Our mind seems very uneasy, chaotic. And we get back into the Word of God and things just start to smooth out. A Bible that's falling apart probably belongs to someone who isn't. It's the doctrine or the teachings of God. The Word of God without error, unchanging, perfect. But unfortunately, too many people today don't believe it's the Word of God. I had a uh, conversation with a man that used to work for me, and we were a TDY, temporary duty assignment in the Air Force, and... um, Of course, in the Air Force, I wasn't in a tent or a foxhole. It was a five-star hotel where Air Force people are supposed to go. And uh, he shared the king-size bed next to me in that room. We had to share a room. It was really tough in it. And, uh, And we happened to be talking about the Bible, and I said, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? And he said, well, some of it. And I said, well, what's some? And they said, well, it's time to go to sleep. We'll talk about this another time. I knew we were never going to talk about it another time. There are many people that the Bible is not the word of God to them. They're going to pick and choose what they like or what they don't like or change it. Why do we have all these versions of the Bible today and probably more being written now? Why? Change it till we're comfortable with it and not sticking with it like the King James it, gets in our face once in a while. It is the Word of God, and too many people, sometimes good Christians, just don't spend the time in the Word of God and believing it, that it's the truth. If there is one thing wrong in this book, 
one thing, then everything is subject. Is salvation really of Jesus Christ? And I think there are many times that can become a problem to people and they, they don't believe this part. Well, that doesn't apply. <laughs> that really starts a very dangerous, slippery slide away from the Lord. The doctrine, the teachings of God have the principles for living a godly life. I bet I can say here, and I'll raise my hand for you, that we all want to live a godly life. We want to please God. How can you learn that without being taught it from this book? You can't. You can't go to, uh, oh, what's his name? Got the big smile, TV guy. Uh, what's? Osteen. Joel Osteen. You're not going to go to Joel Osteen and take his teachings and get saved and live a godly life, your life. This is the only way you can go. This good book. There's no better book for teachings, for doctrine. To teach the unsaved to be saved, to teach the saved how to live for God. It is sound doctrine the Bible teaches us. And sound doctrine means to be in health. This is a healthy book. It's a safe book. It's a sound doctrine. We're told there will be a time when sound doctrine will not endure. But we're also then told that we are to hold fast sound doctrine, healthy teachings. Not the unhealthy teachings of man. Not that all thing that man's right is not good. But much of it is trash. We need to be very careful about what we, what we read. Even if they got doctor in front of their names or been a pastor for 50 years, they're still men and women. And they interpret things where it's very clear in the Word of God. There's no better book for doctrine. And because of that, it helps us avoid false doctrine, false teaching. Things which teach us to blaspheme God, it tells us 1 Timothy 1.20. We see false teachings in our schools, in our laws, in many books, in some so-called Bibles. I wouldn't call them Bibles, but they have Bible written under cover. We need to beware of those perverted doctrines, the philosophies of men and science falsely so-called in Colossians 2.8. And then there's no better book for reproof. Reproof being disapproval or rebuke or reprimand. In other words, to teach that which is wrong. God is not going to let us out there on our own to figure it out. He teaches us what's right, and he teaches us what's wrong. Without knowing what's wrong, we'll offend God. But how can we do it without his word? God will reprimand us through it. In Psalm 89, I've got a lot of verses that I haven't, we can't take the time to look them all up, but Psalm 89, I'm going to pick and choose here, cherry pick a little bit. Psalm 89, verse 30 through 32. <clears throat> if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. God teaches us what is wrong, and when we disobey, when we ignore those teachings will be judged for it. And it doesn't mean we're, gonna, we're not going to lose our salvation, but just as a good father chastises his children because he loves them, our Heavenly Father will chastise us because he loves us. And he wants us to live for him. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict us of our sin. In John chapter 16, verse 8 and 9, and it tells us how God views our lives without Him and with Him. 
according to the light of his word. In Ephesians 5, 13 to 16, that it illuminates our lives and our actions to let us know that we are wrong with God. There's no better book for reproof. But there's no better book for correction. And that simply just means a change that corrects a mistake or removes error and teaches us how to do right. Or to change from wrong to right. How we can live by that which is right. It tells us what to do to correct our behavior, our sin. In Psalm 39, 11. Psalm 39, 11. When thou with rebukes dost correct a man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. We need correction. We need to change the direction that we're going when we have offended God, when we're doing it our way. It tells us what to do to correct that behavior, and when that happens, we'll be happy about it. In Job 5.17, Job 5.17, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. God doesn't say we're going to like chastening, but it's necessary just as we chasten our children. We need the correction and we'll be happy for it. We may not be happy at the moment, but ultimately we will be happy because we'll have pleased God. And our lives will be so much easier. He corrects us because he loves us. The Lord loveth and he correcteth. He corrects our thinking. He straightens out what is true in our minds because we'll conjure up all kinds of things on our own. But he clearly states the truth for us. All we have to do is take the time and read it and believe it and then apply it in our lives. It's not just about reading. It's about application. Knowledge is great, but it's only the first step to wisdom. And then with that wisdom, we can apply it and do great and wonderful things for ourselves, for others, but most importantly for the Lord. It will correct, cor- correct our belief system. Many of us who came out of what's considered Christianity, but they believe that uh, being a good person, yeah, that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, but you got to be a good person. You got to go to church. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to be baptized. That's not the truth. But this book will straighten us out. It'll correct the wrong thinking if they only get into this book. Unfortunately, many won't. It corrects our worldview and life in this world. All the things that are going on in the world today, the culture stuff that's happening. But those of us who have the word of God, we get pretty upset. That's why I, I want to throw my computer through the wall every morning when I read the, the things that's going on because I know the truth. I know what's right, what's good, how our country, the direction our country should be going. But there's so many people that haven't read it, even many Christians the correction will help us have a right world view and then we can live rightly. And then, as I run out of time in just a few minutes, there's no better book for instruction. Simply to communicate knowledge, to teach, to order. It teaches us how we can move from wrong to right, how to do that. We're given instructions. We're given instructions to put a the children's bicycle together at Christmas time, except for us men who we don't need instructions <laughs> until our wives come in and get the instruction book out and straighten us out when we can't put it together. But we need that instruction. 
and maybe at more us guys than not because of our pride. But God instructs us about who he is. We need to know his character and his nature. And he instructs us in that. He wants us to know all about him because he wants us to be just like him. He says, be be ye holy for I am holy. He wants us to have his nature. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He wants us to live that new life with his nature, his characteristics. And so he teaches them. He instructs us and how to do that. And that he instructs us in our purpose for life. Maybe not every little detail about it, but even at times when we try to figure out the will of God for our lives, it may not say here, Lord, I want you to be a preacher. But at the same time, it does. It tells us in Timothy that it's a good thing to be a bishop. God revealed and he used God's people to confirm that call in my life. God will use his word to confirm his will for you. He'll use other believers to confirm his will for you. He gives us instructions through his word. He instructs us not only about who he is, but about us. First, we're just filthy rags in our best of times. There's nothing good about us. Not one thing. If you start thinking, I'm a good person, compared to what? There's nothing good about us. We're depraved. It's who we are. It may not be our fault, but it's the way it is. And that's why Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary, bore our sins, that he gave us salvation through Jesus Christ. And we need to know that about ourselves. That our spiritual condition has nothing to do with God. And that we need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. He instructs us on the world. We may think we know about the world. Yeah, we know what's going on, but He teaches us about the world. What, how bad it really is. He instructs us on how to live in this world. Why too many Christians struggle in this world. The, the answers are here. They're in this book. For every, every thing in your life, the answers are here. You just can't give it a perusal. You have to think about it and read it. And there's no better book to develop Christian maturity, to be made perfect, complete, mature. If not, we'll remain babes in the Lord, like in the church at Corinth. If you want to grow in the Lord, we need to read and apply it in our lives. We need to grow spiritually, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's no place to get that but here. And then lastly, there's no better book to prepare us for a life of good works. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He saved us to walk and to do good works. Not to get saved, but because we are saved. I'm trying to think of, I'm out of time. But I think there are times that we we don't stop and think much. That the things that we do impact not only our lives, but everybody around us. And more importantly, people see us act out, good or bad. If we act out, right, as the Word of God teaches us, then we're a good testimony, a good witness for Christ. And like that young woman led me to the Lord as I watched her life. Oh, yes, she made mistakes. She had problems. But she was someone that lived her faith to the best of her ability. And that opened my mind to the Word of God 
and I got saved. I saw her good works in her life. And that's what we need as well. And there is no place you're going to get it, no better book than this right here. You can read, uh, I'm trying to think, Dr. Spock's book on raising kids and all those kind of things that are out there. And they may be helpful, even though that book I heard is probably make more trouble than it helps. But this book will never lead you astray. There's no better book. The Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from your Bible.